Very intimate problem. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can move in a little bit if you want to. Yeah. We don't have guns. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm glad you started from around. Yeah. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Ratzlaff. I'm the Deputy Director at Global Americans. Um, as we approach a quarter century of Chinese state governance in Venezuela, we want to take a moment to look at the state of Venezuela military and police forces. Um, it's a really important topic, and it's one that understanding what will go forward in Venezuela, one needs to understand what's going on with the military and police, um, not just what's going on within the political system. Today, we're joined by two experts on this topic Ambassador Maria Teresa Malata de Exposito and Brian Balseca. Dr. Blandria is a specialist in defense and security, as well as refugee police. She most recently served as the Venezuelan interim government's ambassador to Brazil, where she's still living. She has a distinguished career in both academia and policy, and has held academic positions at the Universidad Central de Venezuela, Universidad Metropolitana, and the Venezuelan Military Academy. She's also consulted for numerous organizations across the region. And then they can provide a commentary to numerous news outlets, both within Venezuela and beyond. Introducing Brian at FIU is always a little bit intimidating because I don't think he really needs an introduction here at FIU. Not at all. <laughs> I appreciate that. But uh, Brian is the director of the Jackie Gordon Institute, who is co sponsoring this event today. And we're very thankful to you, co sponsoring this with Brian. Uh, he also serves as a cybersecurity policy fellow and an international security fellow at the Big Ten New America C has been featured in local, national, and international media, um, most specifically here in South Florida as one of w WSVN Fox News' political analysts. Uh, his recent publications include two edited volumes on culture and national security in the Americas and democracy and security in Latin America. Um, prior to joining FIU, he served as Senior Research Manager for Sociocultural Analysis at U.S. Southern Command's Joint Intelligence Operations Center South, and before that, who's in the Marines? Well, with that, we will go ahead and turn it over to Ambassador uh, Belanski. Well, morning, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. And I may may apologize for my bad English because I got four years living in Brazil and I love totally my English, you know. I live in Brazil, I speak Portuguese every day, 24 hours a day. and. When Brian and my I say, oh my God, because I need to recover my English to try to speak what happened in the state of the army and police force in Venezuela. I teach for nine years and a half in the army in my country, in the last army in my country, no in the army right now. And it was a big experience for me because I learned uh, about what was the professional army form that we have. And it's totally neutral right now. And my experience in the army force was the first day that I have to obtain new resources in my life. And what's my first day to learn them that in the National Defense University, William J. Bedo Center. I was a student there, and then I was a professor there. For the reason, I really appreciate your invitation, and I would like to present, uh, which is uh, the idea that I have to share with you. Oh. I'm a professor. <laughs> <laughs> and when Brian invited me, Marie, we need to understand what happened right now in the States of Venezuela and military and police force, I say, I put only one or two ideas and then I would like to share 
with question and answer uh, with you. This is two kind of military employees. One is under the Minister of Defense, and another is in the Minister of Poder Popular para las Relaciones Interiores, Justicia y Paz. The police forces, uh, we have prevention and investigation. Right now, the Policia Nacional Bolivariana is under uh, 21,000 hombres y mujeres. We have 22 police states in 23 states. Only the Distrito Capital don't have one police. Uh, we have one, 124 police in 303 municipalities. You have and a half of the municipality have police. And only one uh, police of investigating, say, CPC, but with investigaciones científicas penales criminalísticas. This is according to the law of police services and is set to all the police functions. This is only the police under the law. But we have another police created by, by President San Mandate and not in the Constitution. This is the big trouble with our police. This is FICE, this is GOES, this is CEDIN, Servicio Bolivariano de Inteligencia. Policía Nacional Anticorrupción y Grupo de Operaciones en Protección. This kind of police is under the law. It's created by the order of people of Colombia or by the order of Charles. And this kind of police, you don't understand which is the competence. FICE, for example, was disappeared. FICE. The men of the women and files is under investigation by the Queen of War. Because under files, under boys, the under civilian, the majority of them, the violation of human rights and the violation of the criminal court. Because don't have the framework of the activities of the kind of police. Right now, you have. Under the law, only this. Policia Nacional Bolivariana, 22 police of the states, and a half of the municipality have police, and the six of the set, where all the investigation is scientific and analytical, is the investigation police. Another is outside the law. <clears throat> okay? What happened with the sensation of security in Venezuela? You don't have the number of police that the society needed. Policia Nacional Anticorrupción, which is the training that you needed to against of the corruption. What happened with this? Maduro put people down other police into the Policia Nacional Anticorrupción without training to investigation what happened with the corruption. Or they put Policia Nacional Bolivariana into this kind of police. Uh, the number, when the people uh, request, which is the number, the ideal number, you need four police for 1,000 people. In Venezuela, you have one police. Okay. And the people don't feel safe. The people don't feel, ah, if I need, cross the street during the night, you don't have light. You don't feel safe. What happened right now? Maduro put soldiers, troops on the streets to try that the people feel safe. For example, uh, police of the Air Force or military police or Navy police or National Guard in function of the police. The, police, the military police is a good police for the people now. The air police of the army force, navy police, is people right to feel safe now. It's a really consequence to you don't have another consequence when you don't have a good police. The majority of police leaves the country. When I was ambassador, I received 
police cross the border. They don't say Abdus because he don't feel you know well because they escape of our country. But when you speak with them in another city in Brazil, in the south of Brazil, where we say, Abdus, I'm Policia Nacional de Liberia, or a National Guard. Because I don't need to act. This is the situation of the police. In the case of the military forces, it's different. <laughs> because we have, according to the Constitution, four now, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, and National Guard. And created by the law was charged the militia. In the Article uh, 328, our Constitution, only we have four forces, only force, Army, Navy, Air Force, and National Guard. And Chavez created the militia. The militia is another force, it's not constitutional force, but exists. And was created by Chavez because they decided to put the militia under the law by the presidential order. But it's this, right? What would you say? On the constitution, on the only law, only law. What happened right now? The cabinet of the president have 23 ministers, and a half is military. <laughs> and a half. 44% of the cabinet is military. 10 inactive. With uniform and four retired is the most important quantity of military in charge during the 23 years of Chavismo in power. 44% of the government. Chavez was in power 1999-2012. You have 20%. 25%, 50%. Right now, it's 44% of the military in charge in the government. It's a number, is expressive of the power, of the military power in charge. What kind, what Bolivarian National Army for exists currently? In 1999, when Chavez made the election, we have a professional military process. It was a process began in 1958. Professional military forces with doctrine, training, armies, uh, occidental professional army forces. Between 1999 and 2012, they move to Pretorian army forces because Chavez reformed the law and put more power in the hand of the president. Was Pretorian when Chavez created the militia? The militia is a Pretorian forces to protect the president, not protect the nation. The loyalty moved. It's not the loyalty of the government, it's not the loyalty of the nation, it's the loyalty of the president. And they moved to Praetorian army forces. But right now, in 2023, we have a revolutionary army forces. Why? Because it's egalitarian army forces, they acting as a political party, the ceremonies, the behavior, uh, all the military forces move like a revolutionary uh, army forces. The acting of the military leader is not like a military leaders. It's like a political party leaders, like a Cubans army forces, like uh, Iranian like uh, army forces, like a Nicaraguan army forces. It's that typical behavior of the revolutionary army forces. The identity of the army forces is provided like a basic way. It's not like a 
the behavior of typical army forces. No, no, it's a revolutionary army forces. The influence of the army forces is not by military leaders, it's by political leaders, by the political bodies. And another topic is the influence of the foreign military forces, especially Iran, China, Russia, and Cuba. And when you have Cuba, Iran, China, you have another kind of forces. It's not a coincidence forces, and you have a kind of a revolutionary force. And for this reason, I say, what Bolivarian, Bolivarian National Army Forces exist right now? Revolutionary forces. And the status of the Venezuelan Army Forces, it is my idea. You have Army Forces unable to deal with any threat because have Incomplete doctrine, low operational sizing, limited popular support, the people don't like their army forces, ambiguous legal framework, working like a political party without authority. This is my point of view. Maybe the people have an offer, but when you look what happened with our army forces, you say, what kind of thing that we have? In the concept of strategy defense, they have two points of view. One is external threats, another is internal threats. The external threat is Colombia and US. The internal threat is the opposition. The opposition, the citizens in the opposition. And if you have right now, the opposition is divided, the opposition don't have a leader, you don't have a threat. And if you have good relation from Colombia right now, and you try to have a good relation with UN, you don't have threats. And if you don't have threats, the army forces to enable to deal with any threat. If you don't have a good doctrine, it's incomplete. You don't have autonomy in your budget, you don't have autonomy. You're working like a political party, you don't have a good army force. You don't have a good legal framework, it's ambiguous. The people don't like you, you don't have popular support. And you don't have a good operational sizing. It's really complicated. What the transitional government should do with the security and defense of the nation? If you tomorrow you have an election, what can I do with our army forces? What to do? Transform them, replace them, delete them, or reinstitutionalize something? You have four options. In my opinion, do you need? Two or three topics, you know. What is necessary? Transform them. My ideas transform them. Right? See the leaderships and professionalize. You know, to, to need to move our army forces. In my ideas, not believe them. Many people say, no, we need to lead them. They don't need it. We don't need another army forces. We need civil leadership in the design and execution of the nation's police and professionality. This is my idea. We need to design the security policy, restructure the national defense system, and establish the entire police defense and prepare value. We don't, we don't have anything right now. This is my three principal ideas. And for me, this is, uh, you know, different topics, you know. In my idea, we need to make a big transformation. <clears throat> the first point, change the doctrine. Modification, uh, 
the defense, unified operation, autonomia, full break to the personality. Right now is Hugo Chavez's you know, the commander in chief now is like uh, North Korea, exactly North Korea. Uh, the duration with the staff administration, leadership, the spring, and the sign of the knocking mechanism, reorganization, is modernization or adaptation of the military component, is great the education level. Right now, the, we don't have training, we don't have an a low education, it's horrible. Improved also uh, economic condition, creation, activation, and token of the training, verification, because we have in many labels of uh, the army forces, foreign officer of the, another nation, Cubans, Galerians, Chinese, or whatever organization, and become a highly fabulous dissuasive forces to face external and internal state, state or part of state organization by threats against God. This is my principal ideas. I know this is a lot of information, but you get an idea that I want to try to move. And the leader of a new organization must have the knowledge, the skill, and attitude necessary to a new national army forces. This is a photo of the caucus of the military in the National Assembly right now. When you look at this picture, this is the caucus. It's interesting because the majority of them in the, the principal picture, them, is two commander in chief of the army. You have 11 of the army, two commander in chief of the army, two of the navy, two of the air force, and two and one of the guard. The majority of them is under investigation for corruption. And you say, this is the army. Yes, this is the armed force under Chavismo. If you are loyalty of the power, if you are loyalty of the business, if you are loyalty of the Chavismo, if you are loyalty of Chavez and then loyalty of Maduro, you are the men in power. You are the men in charge. But this is the armed force that we needed in the democratic change. No, you need another kind of leader because all these men and women was military that I know. For example, Jesus Suarez Shudo was my student when he was captain. Was my student. I know him. He was my student, like you. That. And he was a good man when he was captain. Jonas. What happened with this kind of military when he obtain the power and money, <clears throat> change the values, change the behavior, change everything. And if we need to move this kind of values, if we need renew another army forces. I put this picture because for me it's really expressing that when you don't have values, when you don't have a doctrine, when you don't have a, a stronger relation between the democratic leaders, civil democratic leader with ideas that what kind of army for that you needed, and the civil leaders is the most important speech you are military forces in democratic ways, and you put people in the same ways, and the people don't understand what kind of dialogue that we need to know. You 
have this kind of interest. And for us, it's an example, and it's difficult to say, stop. And I finish, and I listen to your questions. And for us, it's really complicated because I teach for nine years and a half in the army. And when I look, the consequence, I feel bad, I feel sad, because I know the majority of the generals, two, one star, two star, three star, and four stars in charge right now, because the majority of them was my students. And when I look them, they say, oh, I would like to work in, in the next army force of my country in a democratic, in the future of my country. But this example is an example that I say, never in my life I would like to live in a country without a democratic force, like, like the democratic forces right now. The army forces right now is not a democratic army force. It's a revolutionary army forces. I would like to work to change them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Thanks. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. And I gave a very good overview of kind of where the military and the police forces are today. The fact that 44% of the cabinet is made up of military or former military yeah. officials is really a startling point and highlights just how important the military will be in any transition yeah. to democracy in Venezuela. Yeah. Um, you discussed the transition from a professional armed force to a libertarian force to a revolutionary force, and now almost a political party in the country. Yeah. Um, this shift in culture seems very clear, but what does that mean for transition to democracy um, looking forward? Is there a step that could be taken to have that shift um, in the in the culture of the military itself? Um, if you could pick one or two items, what would those be? Right, please. Please. Okay. No, um, I think it's a great question and excellent presentation. Really appreciate it. You know, I think it's it's interesting. Um, you know, for for many years now, the military institution has been um <clears throat> the gatekeeper for both change and continuity in Venezuela under you know first Chavez and, and then Maduro. And I think in many ways the military institution um was coup proofed in ways that tie the military institution to the survival regime, right? So th things that, that occurred in the Venezuelan military that Chavez and the Maduro sort of promoted was things like vesting the military leadership into corruption, mm -hmm. patronage, engaging them in criminal activities, things that essentially tied their survival to the survival of the governing party in power. I think there was also a pitting of branches against each other, mm -hmm. right? Ways that you created you know, competition among the branches, particularly in the illicit commercial space, as a, uh, as a means of again coup proofing the institution, so that if one branch fell or decided that it wanted to seek change and it wanted to rise up against the government, you had other branches that were sort of disaggregated uh, in ways that would challenge and, and and sort of compete and likely you know sort of devolve into into violence. And so I, I think that you know there was a lot of coup proofing going on prior to. You know, prior to to the state of the armed forces today, I think if you think about change, I think you can't. You know, uh, change is not going to occur um, as long as the armed forces, you know, collectively resist against any type of you know post authoritarian transition or, or restoration of democracy. Yeah. I think the military institution has been vital in that. The question is, what role does the military play? And I think if you think about a military and a post-authoritarian, you know, uh, a post-authoritarian Venezuela, um, a lot of it's going to you know, be contingent on the role it plays in the transition. So uh, Fabiana Pereira also at the William yeah. Perry Center and I have a publication that's forthcoming that really parses out, not specifically Venezuela, but looks at different types of <clears throat> roles that militaries play during transition, but ultimately what happens to military institutions in post-authoritarian transition. Yeah. And, and we found pretty consistent with what you said. I mean, it's either 
You know, there are cases historically where you see an abolishing of the armed forces, a purging of the armed forces, and sort of a um, you know, sort of reestablishing civilian authority over armed, armed forces, which is reform. You also have uh, a disbanding of armed forces. So you can do away with the armed forces altogether in exchange for some civilian defense force, uh, or you can disband and you know, re, you know, sort of reconstitute uh, an armed forces like you saw in places like Iraq, right? Where you just sort of fired all of the military personnel and then you went back to rehire and it didn't turn out so well in the case of Iraq. Um, but those are the, the the roles that we think you know will likely um, you know likely sort of comp re reinstitutionalize the Venezuelan military in a post authoritarian transition. I think the key is a few things. One, what role does the Venezuelan military play in transition? Is it violent or nonviolent? And how you know sort of how violent is that transition? I think that's important, right? Because if the military force plays a heavy role on one side or the other to the violent transformation. I think that's going to, to, you know, that's going to dictate to, to the role the military plays in a post-authoritarian transition to begin with. Um, the other thing that's really important is the degree of external influence. And, and, you, and you touched on this, the role that the, the Cubans, the Russians, primarily, in my opinion, they, those two constitute the most influence over the, the Venezuelan armed force. Uh, and, and, and then you have, a, a, to a degree, the, the Iranians, uh, particularly in the acquisition of military wares, um, and then, you know, I think to a lesser degree, the Chinese, which the Chinese are far more involved in places like you know, the oil sector, right? Yeah. Um, but, but the role that foreign actors play, and, and we don't just constitute those foreign actors, those are the actors that are involved in the military today. In transition, you know, you might bring the United States in, you might bring the Colombians in, the Brazilians, others might play a role in sort of the reforming of the military institution in, in democratic transition. We don't know what that looks like yet, um, but if there was a post-authoritarian transition, then the role of external actors would be really important, or would be really important in terms of what that you know what that looks like for the other side. Yeah, I think that that was the spirit of your question. That, that's okay. absolutely. Um, turning towards that who perfect question, um, many outside of Venezuela looked at certain junction points or critical junctures as times where the military might have risen up. Why do you both see that they didn't? Um, why was the outside misreading the situation in Venezuela so much? Um, one example of this was um, actually here at FIU in some serious security conference. You know, um, we had a national security advisor come and say, please honor your oath. And many in the room felt that this was a call to arms almost for the Venezuelan military, and it didn't happen. Why was the United States and other actors um, misreading the situation so much? So I don't think it was misreading the situation. I, I think I think what you know maybe what some were trying to do was provoke you know a scenario in which the the Venezuelan military might you know do something. And, and it's interesting because because timing is so critical, right? Um, if if you know a, as a military leader, if you decide you want to rise up, it has to be incredibly well timed, right? Because if you fail, what happens? Right? You're going to jail. You're going in exile, you're going in the ground. One of those things is going to occur if you fail to lead a revolution to overthrow the government. Um, and at the same time, if you don't jump when that sort of change is occurring, then you're going to be cast with the old. You're going to go to jail, you're going to go in exile, right? So timing was, was you know, I think really important there. I, I don't think, um, you know, I think when, for example, you know, uh, I know that Elliot Abrams, you know, uh, um, got caught on a on a podcast with I think a, a, a Northern European uh, podcast channel, which he admitted that the um, that they were bluffing by you know alluding to the fact that the yeah. U.S. military was going to invade. And and I think the part of the bluff, going back to sort of the concept of gumbo diplomacy, right, this idea that the threat itself would provoke some type of act, right? Yeah. The threat of the U.S. military was the instrument being deployed, not the U.S. military, right? And so. The, the idea was that that threat would force the Venezuelan military to pick, right? Do we, you know, we don't know if it's a threat, we don't know if it's true. Do we wait to be overrun by the Americans? Do we jump now and seize the country and try to, you know, and try to, um, you know, to, uh, uh, sort of um, re engage the United States in, in sort of a, a more favorable condition? So there, there was a lot of that going on when the threats were being thrown around. But, you know, uh, you know unfortunately for, for the US and Elliot Abram, he got caught bluffing that. So it kind of killed the credibility of the US military as an instrument of power that the US would, you know, would, you 
you know, deploy to, to Venezuela. I think that hurts a little bit. But that probably meant that a lot of Venezuelan leaders that were contemplating when is the right time, is there a right time, we need to ensure our own survival, that probably kind of, you know, addressed some of those concerns and it might have, you know, led to a simmering of the Venezuelan military from being, you know, engaged. But it, like I said earlier, there was intentional coup pooping going on. One really important distinction, and, and Maria, I'll kick it back over to you. You know, Maria referenced the, the idea of a revolution in armed force today. And I, th I think that's true. In many ways, you know, Chavez systematically purged the military institution to ensure loyalty, yeah. you know, to the Bolivarian Revolution. But, but that also that also is compared with the Cuban case, right? The Cuban Revolution. I, I think there's one really, really, really important distinction between the Cuban case and the Venezuelan case. And that is in Cuba, the military was born out of the revolution, mm -hmm. right? The military did not predate the revolution. The revolutionaries comprised the military institution that was then codified under a Fidel Castro government. In Venezuela, it's been this long systematic purging of the institution to bring it under the revolution. And by purging senior leaders and putting loyal, loyalists in really important positions, um, the technocrats that emerged under Chavez that you know, allowed for consolidation of enlisted personnel, I think those things you know, differentiate in, in, you know, from the Cuban experience but ultimately pathway to where you have a military um, that has divisions. So we can talk about what those divisions are. I think some of those divisions are along ideological lines within the institution today, but nonetheless brings the institution under the revolution in ways that could also be very similar to how the Cubans deploy the military today. I remember and even early morning when I arrived to teach at 6, 6 7 a.m. And the students, you know, cadets running 6 a.m., you know. And as you know, the military, when running, they sun, you know. And all the suns in the 90s is against the guerrilla. Oh my God. Yeah. Because we fight against the guerrilla in the 60s. We have a war with the guerrilla Cuban in the 60s. And we win. When Chavez win the election, they change the sons. Change. Eliminate, delete the music. Do you can believe it? Yeah. For, for example, you say, what happened with this? We win. And then Chavez put Castro in the top of the line, and the oldest general and oldest military that they fight against Castro feel really bad about that. When we have militaries from Cuba in charge of operation in our army, the people feel bad. What, what, what happened? How is this change, for this reason, we have a revolution in army forces right now. It's a great point. I think it was, 19, was it 1967, 69? 1966 and 67. And, and we win. Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> Cuban, the Cubans supported um, a amphibious landing of revolutionary yeah, forces. Yeah, we might that's right. And it's the Venezuelan armed forces, um, you know, had an, an incredible victory against those, those revolutionaries. What, six were, years yeah. fighting, and we win. And in and, and sort of another, you know, even more recent context is you also had the Venezuelan armed forces, you know, pre Castro, I mean, pre Chavez, you know, fighting the FARC and other, you know, Colombian insurgencies on the border. Yeah. And then almost immediately, in, you, know, you know, shortly into Chavez's tenure, um, you know, begins to build bridges between Venezuelan military leaders and far and ELN leadership, in which you know, fast forward today has been really difficult for them to control. But but there was that reorientation. I think that's where Chavez felt the need to begin heavily purging the armed forces because a lot of military generals were unsettled by this reorientation towards embracing leftist revolutionary movements in the Americas. Which ran completely counter to the history of, of the Venezuelan military culture. And you have a lot of stories 
recent news stories are the military escape from Venezuela in the last five years. And they speak with you and they say, Basado, I'm working in the border between Colombia and Venezuela. And you, in front of you, cross the guerrilleros from LAN, from FARC, and you say, Stop. And then you receive a call from the high level ones. No, 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 don't say anything. They have authorization to cross our country. It's true. It's no the journalism. It's totally true. It's friends. And when you don't have the control of your territory, when the territory is in the hand of guerrilla, is narco trafficking group, in the trafficking of gold, in the trafficking, the army for is what? Yeah, that's a good point too. And I think the Venezuelan military was handed probably its largest ever defeat in an ambush in the border region yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. Where the military, so the military is having a hard time reasserting itself, you know, at, you know, reasserting the monopoly on the use of force within its territory. And it's struggling, particularly in the border regions, to control the violent non state actors that might be supported by external actors that are influencing. I always say it on the Brazil over when you say, one of the most enemy that you have is the border of Venezuela. Because when the army force and the police force don't have the control of the territory, the majority of the goons, the gangs, leave on the border, and the police and the army force is not your friend because they are allied of the criminals. And the transition to, to try to speak in positive, you know, and open the dialogue in two different ways for me. Understand the damages in the army force, it's important, which is the kind of the damages uh, after 25 years, uh, recognize uh, the mistakes, uh, recovery, uh, you know, the elements, including March, the new step, because we need to try to look at the future. Make justice, because in, in my mind, I know that we have good soldiers into the army force. We have. When you open the folders, you have good men and women then inside. Clean the house is important. Clean the house. And work together with the civilian and the military in the police of security. We need it. A new army force. Because we don't have a transition without them. It's impossible to make a transition without military forces. So let me, can I ask a question as a follow-up to that? I think that's been one of the biggest struggles is that, you know, there, there are very few incentives for Venezuelan, this goes to your question earlier, uh, very few incentives for Venezuelan military aid to break rank with the Maduro government. Yeah. You know, I, I recall early on, um, you know, in sort of US messaging, there was this discussion around amnesty for military mm -hmm. leadership that yeah. ultimately supported the you know, democratic transition. And, and I recall at the time, I was very vocal about, you know, my challenges with that in that, you know, the, the, the same thing was made to, to the military junta in Argentina and others, right, in which they were provided amnesty for turning over the, the institution back to civilian authorities. And then decades later, you know, as governments change, yeah, and now, you know, they're sitting in jail and they were, you know, they were, so that amnesty was revoked through democratic process. And so it became, it, it, became, it, it was tough to sell the message to Venezuelan military leadership that amnesty for the rest of your lives is guaranteed if you make that break. It's, it's impossible. Right? I know, I know. It's impossible because at the time, 1985, you don't have a criminal international court. And in your own law, you can provide amnesty. But right. in our cases, it's impossible because Venezuela is under the investigation of the right. criminal court. Right. And the military forces, the elite of the military forces is under investigation. It's impossible for us 
to speak with them and say, you are an amnesty. It's impossible. I know. I know. And that was the challenge. And so it, it wasn't resonating. We weren't getting the kind of departure or defection of senior military leaders that were part of the coup proofing of the institution, you know, in the previous you know two decades, right? And largely because because of that. For this reason, I remember that in 2017, in the in the most difficult part of the protest on the street, um, we are my student Texi was with me in the protest on the street, and we have a student in the police. Do you remember? One of our students was as a part of the Policia Nacional Bolivariana. And I remember that one day in my classes, he, he, he spoke with me and said, Profe, I can, I can, you know, he was police. And in 2017, the majority of National Guard, or I want to say, in the, I, I need to speak in Spanish, said, Yo no quiero ir a la Haya. I don't like, you don't quiero ir a la Haya. They are really, they don't, he, he feels, no, no, no. For me, it's impossible to torture, to use a gun, to, to kill one student, because I know which is the consequence, you know? And right now, we have, one of the most important files in the International Criminal Court, we have 320 files by torture. Torture. We have 222 political prisoners. It's not a joke. Yeah. And they know. They know the Minister of Defense, the Commander of the International Guard. They know it's impossible to say, oh, you are an amnesty. And it's, it's a good point that you made because at, at the end of the day, I think the, the, the inspiration for FICE and for the um, you know, sort of recognition of the militia was that to serve as the, the top instrument that's in the streets repressing yeah. and, and violently attacking civilians, the, the collectivos, which spun out of, of the Bolivarian circles that, that Chavez stood up in the, and then started what's to arm in 2016. That was a transformation. And, but that, in many ways, was designed to replace the fact that the military and police didn't want to be the ones repressing civilians yeah. innocently in the seats, but you still needed institutions that you can control to do that. And then, you know, then I think as the fear of all, the concern was that you have all of these autonomous, you know, colectivo groups, yeah. right, in the barrios that are building their own influence and their own, you know, ability to use force. And so, you know, um, yeah, it, it, I think that evolved to sort of the consolidation of those, you know, of those into a formalized I received, I received in Brazil, a former officer of the uh, Air Force, and he was working in DGC, Direction General de Contrainteligencia Militar, and he was witness of torture into the DGC. I received him, and he was with proof, and he was witness, and he was one of the most important witness of the torture. And he was videos. And he, he, when he was he crossed the border, he was received for the Brazil, it's a job that's been 23 years. Uh, and when I spoke with him, and he said, How do you feel when you see the doctor? He said, For me, it was the most difficult situation that I lived because I saw when another official of the Air Force torture men like me. And he really his life to cross the border with the proof. It's real. It's totally real. And you say, okay, we need change this by democratic ways. 
with elections and the day after the election is that we have a free and fair election. The big question is the role of the armed force. I want to pick up on that. We're talking about the fact that there could be no amnesty, the promise of amnesty doesn't look very, very real. Um, what can we do to ensure that the military will respect free and fair elections and support them, knowing that at the end of the day there may be consequences if the rose put out of For me, the big question is if we have if big 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 if we have a free and fair election and a little of the power and the international community push pressure to the new president or the new president and obtain the power by free and fair election the, the role of the armed forces is essential to provide the support of the new government. And the big question is the National Guard ammunition. No, the army. Because the army is the power. But the big business is in the hand of National Guard. The business. But the support of the rest of democracy is important. And when I say the big democracies, it's the great democracies. It's not Iran, China, Russia, and America. It's the democracy. The United States, Canada, and Europe. But the role, the support, of the army is really important. If they decide to support the new government, that's okay. But the liberty, the immunity, and the impunity of the elite of the army force depend on my world. They are freedom. Because Maduro is the president. If Maduro leaves the power, what kind of power do I give? This is the big question. Because they know if Maduro leaves the power, the majority of, they, of them go to the jail. For me, is a negotiation process before the election. You need to build a bridge for them. If the majority of them is involved in the corruption, Outside. Or if human rights, violation of the human right, of if international criminal crimes, you don't, you don't make an offer for them. But it's corruption. But support the new government. It's a negotiation process for me. Political process, negotiation process. But when I say you need to transform them, clean the house, and open a dialogue, because right now you don't have dialogue between the opposition leaders, democratic forces, and military. You don't have a dialogue because Maduro has the control of the army. You need broke and you need open the dialogue between civil leaders, the opposition leader, and the and democratic leaders. It's a negotiation, but right now it doesn't exist. As a follow-up question, shifting gears just a little bit, 
Um, so you mentioned the need for the support of the democracies in the mm -hmm. US, Europe, Canada, but you were the ambassador to Brazil, yeah. another large democracy on the shared border with Venezuela. Yeah. What role do you see the new administration of Brazil play um, in any possible transition to democracy or in US or not US in Brazilian Venezuela relations more broadly? Well, oh, the new president uh, opened the relation with Maduro again and opened the embassy uh, in Caracas. As you know, the embassy was closed for two years. And they decide to open the new relation with everybody. They see she, China last week. And signed a bunch of deals. Huh? Signed a bunch of deals. Signed 20 new. And I don't know what happened, but Brazil is no don't have a foreign policy with a confrontation with everybody. They are friends with everybody. And the last sentences of Lula surprised for everybody because it was an ideological sentences, you know, in China. It's not for free in trade commerce was so close to Russia against Ukraine. And nobody I'm very happy with this. But Lula is important because it's uh, one of the last white arms of the left parties. And if he speak with Maduro and convince Maduro to make um, free and fair election, it's important. I think has influence with Maduro. And Petro is important because it's our neighbor, it's Colombia and Brazil. Maybe it's a good player to put pressure on their backs to make a good election. And if we have an election, maybe do not recognize the new government. Because for Brazil, it's better have a democratic neighbor. Brazil is important. I don't mind. But Brazil is important. It's really important. It's a neighbor to and the immigration process is 500 people a day cross the border. Venezuela migrants, 500, 600, 700 a day cross the border. And they have a big operation on the border. It's a lot of money. Brazil put a lot of money on the border every day. It's in charge of the army forces. And maybe is Lula take a role in the new election, but we don't listen to Lula. Um, I would like to open it up for questions, if that's okay with both of you. Um, so everyone, if you have questions, yeah. please, um, I guess raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. My, my question is, uh, going back to the elections, and, and being that there's not a whole lot of time to, to fix and correct some of these problems. My concern is we saw back like around 2020 at that time, the US, there was a lot of momentum in, in bringing some major changes in Venezuela. Um, our country was really supportive of seeing some of these changes, but yet um, we saw those things, even, even with that momentum, it got completely thwarted by, you know, you go back to the colectivos mm -hmm. doing the, the dirty work that, you know, for, for press and for posture, well, it's not us, it's somebody else coming in and doing these things. And it just seems like there are there are forces right now at play right, right in that region that it wouldn't be convenient for, for them to have a major democratic change coming into Venezuela. And, and I'm talking about things like, uh, you know, you look at uh, Mercado, 
strikes and those things where it seems like the changes in Colombia haven't made any improvements on that. And some instances, some are going to argue that there has been a, a further increase and a further collaboration between Venezuelans and the Colombians in that part of the, the narco state, right? So the, there's a lot of forces. What would it actually require to see a really free and fair election happen and that that can stand? Because it, it, it in my opinion, you know, is it just, it can't just be the US. There has to be other factors at play that come in and give that support to say, hey, you're going to be supportive of this transition as difficult as it is. If you're going to elaborate on that. Well, according to the Constitution, the election is the next year. It's convenient or not, depend on my rule, not depend on us. For us, it's more convenient if the election is this year, but according to the law, it's the next year. But for the rest of the region, it's important to have a democratic government in Venezuela. Because when you see Venezuela, Venezuela is the worst country in the region in all the topics. It's a narco-trafficking state. It's a trafficking, all the trafficking is in Venezuela. Gold, guns, drugs, people, corruption, laundry money. And I know that the rest of the country of the region is better for it, the rest. If Venezuela change. In another topic, stop the immigration. The more principal product of importation right now is not the oil, it's people. Seven million and a half of immigration is the principal immigration crisis if the world is the Venezuelan. If you need to stop the immigration, you need to change the government of Venezuela. Is convenient? Yes. Is difficult? Yes. But I feel the majority of the international community has said, oh, okay, Venezuela. But it is what it is. You have different moments. You know, the momentum. 2014 is right now. No. 2017 is okay now. 2018 was the momentum. So the 2020, COVID-19. And right now, we, we are outside the news. Only for the immigration news, the people know what happened with Venezuela. And we are in the news again because the regime decide clean the house of the corruption. This is Ajuste de Cuentas entre Bandas. It's real, it's clear. But for me, maybe the election is the issue. I pray, I'm Catholic, I pray every day that we have free and fair election because I need combatant. I have seniors outside. But it's convenient. It's convenient for, for the rest of the people. Maybe we have a good presidential candidate. We have primary election in October. Nobody knows what happened. I would like to make my vote in Brazil. We need to organize the people. Day by day. Another person, please. So I wanted to ask, we've been talking a lot about the issue of, you know, like the existing 
prejudices and things that exist within the military and to the military. And you talked about how it's important to like get rid of the the negative perspective that people have in the military, since especially like for the sake of feeling making everybody feel safe, you're putting actual military for in the streets. Mm -hmm. So my question is like, how does one go about with all the polarization that exists in the country? How does one go about like embracing these narratives that exist from the people against the military, the military against the people, the military against the world? And all those things, how do you go about changing that, that, that narrative, that, that negative perspective that we have of each other to create that change, to reach those negotiations? You, you worked in the military. How does, how does that, how do you go about that? It's a really difficult question. It's, it's really complicated because when you don't have a sensation of safety and the people don't trust in the police, is the worst, you don't feel trust, you, know, you don't feel confidence in the police. And the people call the police when you don't have another option. And when Maduro put people on the street to try to obtain this kind of sensation, and it's no police. Because, for example, let me to explain with an example. In Brazil, the civil police is the name is Policia Militar, and the name of the, the uniform is Policia Militar, but it's civil police, and it's you feel uh, weird because it's Policia Militar, and it's, it's militar. and it's civil police, but in the rest of the world, it's police. You know, police, civil police. In Venezuela, you have police, but into the uh, military forces, you have policia militar, policia aérea, policia naval. This is the kind of military police for the military forces. When you have trouble into the military places, do so you can imagine? One air police or navy police or military police on the streets into uh, people fighting for a crash, or you have uh, murder on the street. And when you call the police, the people going into the car is a military police. This kind of situation is really complicated for the society right now. The people don't have dialogue with this kind of people. Or when you call the police, it's a militia. And the militia in Venezuela has a part of public employees, people without training, or all the citizens has a part of the militia. When you don't have the number of police that you needed, Maduro decided to put these kind of people like a police forces. And you don't have security. You have the sensation that people with uniform on the streets. You don't have a plan of security. You don't have uh, planification of security. It's complicated. And for in another way, the number of murder, the number of robbery, the number of lower robberies decrease in into the Venezuela. The people say, why? Because you have 7 million outside. And the immigration, you have immigration of doctor, economist, engineer, but the bad people left the country. Tren de Aragua, for example, the majority of guns, Tren de Aragua, Tren de Oriente, Tren, the name is Tren, Tren, leaves the country too. 
And the majority of them is Colombia, Peru, and another. And in, in, in Brazil, for example, they move into the border and they have joint venture with the BCC in Brazil. They have business with the guns in the rest of the country. And the people say, Venezuela, ah, you don't have your security right now. The majority of the cities in Venezuela. Well, why? Because the malandros leave the country too. And for one way, you don't have the number of relief that you need, but in another way, you have a lower level of the insecurity for this reason. If you don't mind, I have a second question. We're yeah. actually out of time, unfortunately. I'd like to keep the conversation going for a long time still. So, uh, we're probably going all day, and we have to end, unfortunately. Um, so thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for having the Global Americans here today. Um, this conversation, I'm sure, will continue afterwards, but thank you all for coming, and thank you to those who joined us online as well. So like the cult of personality. Yeah. My question is, how do you go about telling the military that are already serving that if they negotiate like exchanging the transformation of the military, how do you go about that? Como te convences de que no tiene que servir al presidente? Cambiando al presidente. Ajá. Pues con el tema del del culto de personalidad, cómo rompes esa barrera? Cambiando el presidente y teniendo un liderazgo militar, teniendo Yo creo, yo pienso lo primero es nombrar un ministro de la defensa civil. O sea, hay que romper eso, ¿no? Y, y que el liderazgo sea un liderazgo civil y, y, cambie, y rompiendo eso. O sea, primero quitando el... A Chávez lo transformaron como en Corea del, del Norte, ¿no? El comandante supremo y eterno. Entonces tú tienes que romper eso. Va a costar. Pero se puede. ¿Y cree que los militares deben ser completamente independientes de lo que sea que pase políticamente en Venezuela? No, 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 no puede ser independiente porque las Fuerzas Armadas dependen de la nación. Pero sí, sí se puede. Ahora.